where she works individually wow. until like August. <laughs> yeah, so it's crazy. There's gonna be like such a blip in the in the data this year. Yeah, there like is. everything. All right, so we are, I think, um, here. Yes, we can, are. Can I share my screen on just share my screen uh, on Zoom? I'm sorry. I just share my screen normally on Zoom and should. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I think we are on here. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Asheville Museum of Science Ask a Scientist series. My name is Abby, and today, happy Friday the 13th, we're going to be talking about weird things today with Sarah Goodnight. And so Sarah is a PhD student at East Carolina University. Uh, she studies amphibian parasites specifically, and she's interested in their weird life cycles and how they use all different sorts of hosts to get to live and invade. <laughs> and, and also she's gonna touch on why parasites are actually useful and important for us. So um, I also like to mention this just because it's a fun fact about Sarah. She can also run a hundred miles without stopping and she really likes mushrooms. So if anyone has questions about those things as well, Sarah is the person to ask. All right, Sarah, you ready? Yes, I am. All right, take it away. All righty. Oh, and please, everybody, go ahead and send in questions um, on Facebook, and I will be happy to pass them along to Miss Sarah. All right. Can y'all see my screen? Okay. Is it working? Fabulous. Okay. Um, so, oh gosh, sorry. I hope I don't get too many notifications. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, Abby. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, really excited that it's Friday the 13th. It is actually my sister's birthday today, so that is quite hilarious for her. Um, but I would love to talk to y'all today about parasitic worms and just parasites in general, um, what they do to their hosts, um, how they're important, um, and some of the really interesting, um, maybe hidden effects that they have on our ecosystems. So I'll start out with what do I mean when I say parasite? What is a parasite? So parasites can be an absolutely enormous diversity of organisms. So you have our, your uh, parasitic worms here. Um, so tapeworms are something that a lot of people are familiar with, nematodes, things like that. Um, actually, I'm gonna say real quick, there are gonna be some kind of gross worm parasite photos in this um, presentation. Hopefully none of them are, are too gross, um, but just a fair warning to anyone who's sensitive to that kind of thing, um, I will be showing some uh, parasite worm photo type stuff. So just so you know, um, but also parasites can be um, infective to humans. So this is a parasitic worm called the guinea worm. Uh, and so this is a blister on a man's foot with this white little thing here um, coming out of that blister is actually a parasitic worm. Um, and the way that uh, we used to remove these worms was a, a stick that you wrap the worm around and you actually pull it out of the person's foot by turning that stick and wrapping that worm around and that's how you extract this parasite. Um, so that's a really uh, fascinating one, I think that we can talk about later if anyone has any specific questions about it. Um, but parasites can infect humans. Um, so ticks are another great example. They're really important for human health as well as for wildlife. That's a really common parasite that we have around here in North Carolina at very high densities. Um, and we also have some very unique parasites, um, like the tongue-eating isopod. Um, so the tongue-eating isopod, you can see here, um, is an isopod that enters a fish's mouth. It eats the tongue completely, and then the isopod itself, rather than eating the tongue and leaving, it actually replaces uh, the tongue of the fish with its own body. And so it becomes the tongue. And actually the really interesting thing about these little guys is um, the fish actually leads a relatively normal life. Um, the isopod actually functions as a very good functional tongue. So that's really interesting. And I just have to zoom in on this guy because uh, these little fellas are some of the cutest parasites out there. They have these adorable little faces. Um, and these also can be found off the coast of North Carolina. Um, a lot of my friends who work um, with fish often our estuaries um, come across these guys sometimes and they say that the first day that you see a tongue eating isopod is not a day you will ever forget. <laughs> um, so parasites can be incredibly diverse um, and there are a bunch of different ways we can use the term parasite and we can use that term for um, animals across the um, 
globe. So birds can also be referred to as parasites. So brood parasites. Um, a bird is a brood parasite if it places its egg into the nest of a different bird species and leaves the egg for those birds to take care of instead of itself. So this is a cuckoo bird. Um, it's a bit comical how large the nestling is compared to this poor beleaguered adult. Um, but cuckoos are a really famous bird that parasitize other bird parents by basically abandoning their own um, eggs to be taken care of by them. Um, but also plants can be parasites. So a lot of people don't know that mistletoe um, is a parasitic plant. Um, it's an epiphyte that lives uh, on sort of the external parts of trees. Um, the berries are also poisonous, which a lot of people don't know. Um, but mistletoe, uh, the interesting thing about them is that they're, uh, the name of their group of plants is called foradendron, which essentially means tree thief, uh, which is cool. And then down here on the bottom right, these are ghost pipes, which are another type of parasitic plant. Um, and they, if you'll notice, are white, which means um, they don't need uh, chlorophyll because they don't have to photosynthesize. They actually get all of their nutrition by parasitizing not a tree, but um, the fungus that lives on the tree roots. So that's what they parasitize to live. And they also live in North Carolina. Um, so you can see ghost pipes occasionally as you're walking along a forest trail. Um, most people think they're fungus, but they are actually plants. Okay, so what all this sort of boils down to here is that um, parasites, the term parasite is a very broad term. Um, and the two basic tenets of parasites is that number one, they gain some benefit from their host um, and their host is harmed in some way from that benefit. Um, and number two, a true parasite does not kill the host. It is not a very smart strategy to try to live off of a host um, if you kill it because then you've got no host. So those are the two main um, parts of being a parasite. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, and the other thing too that I'm going to talk a lot about today is that parasites are incredibly abundant and they are incredibly important links between species and make our food webs complex. So up here at the top, um, this is a food web that does not include parasites. So each little box is a species and all of these lines are the links between species. Now this is what a food web looks like when you include parasitic species. So as you can see, there are way more species connections and uh, the overall structure of this food web is incredibly complex. And so parasites are super important for our um, ecosystems in terms of um, stability and complexity. So parasites are super important, right? They um, themselves are incredibly diverse. So you, can ha you have parasites that are worms, parasites that are ticks, parasites that are insects, um, and parasites that are birds. They themselves are incredibly diverse, but almost more importantly, they infect hosts across taxa and across ecosystems. You would be very hard pressed to find an, an organism on this planet that does not have a parasite that infects it. Almost everything has parasites. Um, and an estimated 40% or so of species um, on the planet are parasitic in some way, which is an absolutely enormous percentage. Uh, and so as Carl Zimmer said in his book, Parasite Rex, which is a really cool book that if y'all have any interest in parasites, you should totally read. Um, he asserted that this, we have this idea of parasites that they are very um, basic organisms, something like a worm, not interesting, um, maybe even bad, not good for um, ecosystems. But in fact, they are these very complex, incredibly highly adaptive um, creatures that have a lot to tell us about not just their personal ecosystems, but about biology itself. So I really love parasites. So I want to pause really quick and tell you a quick story that I really think exemplifies how um, important parasites are and also how they interact with their ecosystems in ways that we may not expect. So back in the 90s, out in the Western US, scientists and students at universities began discovering uh, frogs that were had some really strange deformities. We had frogs that had eight legs, 
frogs that had no legs, uh, really strange looking frogs. And the uh, main thing that people started noticing about this phenomenon was that uh, the deformed frogs were mainly being found in agricultural ponds. So ponds that were directly adjacent to our farm fields. Uh, so obviously the first thought you might think um, hearing this story is, well, obviously it's chemical runoff, right? It's runoff from our agricultural um, fields and centers that are causing frogs to become deformed. And so you might imagine that at the time um, when people were first figuring this out, that is a very scary concept because wow, we are putting these chemicals on our food. We are putting these chemicals on the food that we feed the animals that we eat. So this was a very scary um, event that was occurring. You know, you never want to find deformed animals near where you grow your food, right? So scientists decided, okay, we have to get to the bottom of this. So first they thought, okay, what's going on with these chemicals that are being leached into these ponds? Well, it was mainly nitrogen and phosphorus based fertilizers, which don't cause any sort of deformity. They mainly cause what they're supposed to do, plant growth, algae growth, right? Um, but they have no, but there was no connection directly between bodily deformity and fertilizer. So now really what the heck is going on? Well, scientists decided, okay, let's look a little bit closer at these ponds. What's so different about ponds that are right next to agricultural fields versus ponds that are elsewhere? Well, as I mentioned, fertilizer causes overgrowth of plants and overgrowth of algae. And this is a um, phenomenon called eutrophication. Um, a lot of people are familiar with it. Um, so a lot of the ponds that were surrounding our agricultural fields looked like this. So they were super green, covered in algae, um, absolutely brimming with uh, photosynthetic organisms. So, all right, scientists decided, all right, well, let's start collecting samples. What else is going on here? Let's collect the animals that live in these ponds. Let's collect water samples. Let's collect algae samples and figure out what's going on. As they began doing so, they came across enormous amounts of snails. So why are the snails important? Well, snails, number one, are very important and abundant grazers in pond ecosystems. They eat algae. So you can see pretty easily the connection between, okay, agricultural fertilizers are causing, causing algae to grow at very high rates. Now you have in grazers like snails eating as much as they want and having as many babies as they want. And so you have this explosion in snail populations. Now, the important thing about snails as well is that they are very important hosts for trematodes um, or flukes, which is a parasitic worm. Um, these parasites infect snails almost always as their primary host. And what's really important is that a single snail can produce millions of parasite larvae over its lifetime. So, all right, let's look inside the snails. What's going on inside of these snails? Well, scientists ended up finding very high population size of a certain worm, a certain parasite inside of these snails called Riveroia. And this is a photograph of Riveroia. This is a larva, a cercaria, and this is the um, stage of the parasite that infects frogs. Um, and this photo I think is of a, a dead one that's been preserved. Um, I will point out that these diverticula, um, the little squirrely bits, um, are normally like bright blue or bright green. So they're absolutely gorgeous parasites. They are so pretty. Um, so I found scientists started finding a lot of Riveroia in these ponds. Well, the interesting thing about Riveroia is that it does infect frogs, but in general, it doesn't always cause these very dramatic deformities. It generally doesn't always cause like eight extra legs, like what they were seeing at low density, at low population size. But what was happening at these ponds, the parasites were at enormous population sizes. Um, you would have 90% of these snails carrying this parasite. And if each snail can release a million larvae into this pond, you can start to see that we have this huge imbalance happening. So really quick to go over the life cycle of Riveroia, um, the parasite starts out in these snails 
the snails shed parasite larva into the water column, which um, attack tadpoles. And they um, attach to the tadpole right where the limbs grow out of the side of the tadpole. And what occurs if you have sufficient um, population size of these parasites, if you have a lot of parasites glomming onto these frogs, you get frogs that grow a bunch of extra legs because they have this disruption in limb growth. Oh, I have a question. Are the legs fully functional? The legs? They actually are not. And that's a really important part of this life cycle. So as you can see, once the parasite gets into the frog, the next host is a bird. And this parasite depends on the bird eating the frog to continue its life cycle. Um, and what happens when you're a frog that has a bunch of extra legs that don't work properly, you can't run away very well. And so this parasite, by modifying its frog host and causing it to grow these extra legs and be able to form, actually benefits its own life cycle um, and benefits itself because birds are going to eat these infected frogs at very high rates. And so then what happens at the end of the life cycle is the bird eats the frog, poops back into the pond um, and releases eggs that infect snails again and the whole thing starts over again. Question. Yeah, so Molly had a really good one. She asked, uh, can you talk about how such complex life cycles can evolve in parasites? Because it seems pretty risky that you would de depend on all these different hosts. So what is the benefit? Exactly, okay, great question, yes. So it really does seem not a very smart move, right? If you depend on three hosts to even complete one life cycle, uh, what happens if one of your hosts is gone? You know, that's not a very, uh, that's not a very good strategy from a surface level. Well, what ended up happening was, so the ancestral stage of um, this type of parasite was a single host organism. But what happened was, um, and there are a couple different theories about how exactly this happened, but um, what a lot of people seem to agree on is that the host for the ancient parasite was a prey item. And so that parasite began getting eaten and killed with its host by predators. And so predators were eating the prey that were infected with this parasite and eliminating parasites from the population. And that's not good for parasites, right? So what ended up happening was parasites evolved the ability to infect the predator as well as the prey. And so not only did they survive that transition from prey to predator, but predators are generally larger and more longer lived. Um, and so parasites could actually exploit the more the higher level of resources, I guess, from a predator. Um, and that actually set the ball in motion to start developing these really crazy life cycles. Um, question. So do, do parasites have it in their DNA who they're going to infect? Or do they just have to be able to deal with the host conditions? Really interesting question. So I guess, yes, um, in that parasites and their hosts co-evolve, so they evolve next to each other um, over you know, millions of generations. And so a lot of the times parasites are incredibly specific about the type of host that they can infect. So for example, with the trematode parasites that I'm talking about, most of them can only infect one species of snail. If they don't have that one species of snail, they die, even if they have every other species of snail under the sun, they won't survive. And so, yes, it is really encoded in their uh, DNA, I guess, which hosts they can survive in. Now, that being said, there are a lot of parasites that can infect a very wide variety of hosts. And in that respect, that evolutionary uh, connection is a little more loose um, to the point where there are some parasites that can infect us and they can infect a whale, which are two very different animals. <laughs> um, so it's really, it's really dependent, I guess, on the type of parasite, but most of the time it is encoded within the parasite that I need this host and this host only. Now, that's a good question. Um, cool, okay, so right. So now we've sort of solved this mystery, right? Um, it's not, oh, another question, go for it. 
Yeah, I love this one. Um, Simon is wondering, can parasites have parasites? Yes, that is called a, um, oh gosh, there's a word for it. I should know this. Um, hyperparasite, I think is the word. So parasites can have parasites. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Let me think. Oh, great, great um, example. So leeches can actually carry trematode parasites, just like river roya. Um, and so generally when you have these hyperparasite situations where a parasite is within another parasite, they are normally two very different types of parasite. Um, so like a leech versus a trematode are very distantly related. And so they, so one of them can infect the other. Generally, you don't have the same type of parasite infecting something that is very closely related to. Um, but great question, absolutely. There are a ton of really cool examples of hyperparasites that I can't think of off the top of my head now, but um, leeches are a good one. They get infected with a lot of random, like smaller worm parasites, which is pretty cool. So very good question. Um, cool, so yeah, so um, we've really discovered or um, this mystery has sort of been, uh, dis, uh, has been um, elucidated, I guess. Um, so let's real quick run through this positive feedback loop that we see in these agricultural ponds. So first we have um, agricultural fields leaching fertilizer into drainage ponds. Eutrophication occurs and algae grows out of control which means that grazer populations like snails grow out of control. The more snails you have, the more parasites they're shedding into the water column. And that leads to higher levels of parasite infection. So more frogs are infected, but also more frogs have a lot of parasites per frog, which leads to a lot of deformed frogs in these systems. Whoops, there we go. Um, a lot of deformed frogs means that the birds are eaten really well. There are a lot of birds and they are eating a lot of frogs um, because they are so easy to catch. And so you end up getting a lot of infected birds. Those birds are returning to those ponds to forage, to eat more frogs, and they are pooping parasite eggs back into that pond and restarting the cycle all back over again. And so this story really um, exemplifies how not only are parasites very important as components of ecosystems, um, but they are a huge part of monitoring ecosystem stability and health. Uh, so when I say ecosystem stability, what I mean is that a stable ecosystem generally is one that is robust to uh, disturbance. So um, a stable ecosystem is going to be able to recover better versus an unstable or degraded ecosystem. Um, and um, when the balance of an ecosystem is thrown off by something like fertilizer, something like human disturbances, parasite balance is thrown off as well. And it can have huge impacts on um, the health of our wildlife, as well as our own health. There are a lot of parasites that infect us um, that are uh, parts of these really complex ecosystems. And um, there has been a very well-established link between degrading ecosystems and um, emergence of disease in humans. So um, I will segue with that for the second part of what I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit about what I do, um, what my day looks like um, and how I use this type of parasite to um, uh, study parasite population dynamics in wildlife. Um, so I do focus on amphibian parasites in particular, um, and I'm really interested in how they modify their hosts, but also how host behavior and ecology itself affects the parasite. Um, and I generally don't use Riveroia, uh, the frog mutating parasite, as much. Um, I used to work on that system, but I have moved to a different system now, but I do occasionally come across some deformed frogs in the field um, so this little photo of this little green guy um, I took just this past summer. He's got three legs on his left side where he should have uh, just one. And um, your earlier question, um, or one of the earlier questions asked, you know, are these legs uh, functional? You can see from this photo pretty well that this little teeny leg poking out the top is not going to be very functional, right? So you can imagine looking at this frog that it's going to have a really hard time escaping predators. 
Um, but I generally don't work as much with that parasite. I work with a different one called Halopagus. Um, and it's really unique because it lives in the mouth of frogs. Um, so you can see from this photo down here on the bottom right, all of these orange blobs are worms and they have set up shop in the mouth of this frog right along its cheek. And so Halopagus is a very interesting parasite that I use as a model system to study parasite populations. Um, so real quickly to run through the Halopagus life cycle, it um, is very unique in that it has four hosts. Um, Halopagus starts out in a snail, just like Riveroya, um, but it infects zooplankton, which then get eaten in large numbers by odonates or dragonflies. So dragonflies and damselflies are aquatic for the first part of their life cycles. Um, and so they eat a lot of zooplankton while they're under there, as well as each other. They're very cannibalistic, so I'll come back to that. Um, and then once these dragonflies uh, metamorphose and turn into adults, they are eaten by frogs and other amphibians. Um, and that is the completion of this life cycle here. Um, the frog, again, releases those parasite eggs through its poop back into the pond and the cycle starts over again. Um, and I really want to stress here that Halopagus is a great model system for studying parasites. Um, as I've sort of shown through the different parasites I've run through, a lot of parasites are internal. So we don't always know if a organism is infected with a parasite just by looking at it. Sometimes we have to dissect it. Well, with Halopagus, with frogs, we don't have to dissect any frogs. We don't have to, I don't have to go out and euthanize any frogs in the field to dissect them. All I have to do is waltz out in the field with my little spatula, open frog mouths, and I can just count the number of worms that I see. And so it's really easy on me to evaluate parasite populations in the wild. And it's great that I don't have to dissect any frogs because that would be sad. Um, the other thing about Halopagus is all four of those hosts that I mentioned are very accessible, they're very abundant, and of course this parasite is easily identifiable across hosts, um, particularly in the frogs. Uh, this worm is the only parasitic worm that infects frogs in the mouth, or here you can see on the bottom, they also can live in the ear canals, the eustachian tubes of these frogs. And it's the only parasite in North America that's going to live in those places. So if I open a frog's mouth and I see a worm in its ear or a worm in its mouth, I know it's Halopagus, which is great because most parasitologists have a lot of trouble identifying what the heck that worm is. And so that's really great for me. Question? So in the beginning, we, we defined the parasites as something that's negatively affecting the host, but won't kill it. Are there any hosts in any of these life cycles, like for instance, the bird in your last example that are unknowingly affected? Because it doesn't seem like much happens to the bird. Or in this one, I guess like the frogs are depositing the eggs, right? But mm -hmm. so what happens, like what is the negative impact for the ones that are just pooping out the eggs? <laughs> so that's a great question because um, with trematode parasites, they actually generally don't negatively impact their um, final host where the adult worms live as much. Um, so there is a slight, um, I guess you'd say like an energy deficit. So parasites do take energy from their host. Obviously a tiny worm in the stomach of a bird is not really going to do a lot. Um, generally these parasites are only detrimental to the final like bird host when they are at very high um, densities. Uh, so when you have a worm or a bird that is infected with hundreds of worms, then you then the bird tends to get sick. But in general, it is a very well known phenomenon that trematodes don't affect their definitive host as much. So that's a really good question. I actually am a, a going to talk about some negative effects that happens in the frogs um, here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Um, generally, most of the detrimental effects to the hosts occur earlier in the life cycle. So um, when the parasite larva, you know, attach to the frog and make it grow extra legs or that kind of thing. But great question. Um, yeah, so um, the other thing too about Halopagus is that it is impactful on its hosts. Um, frogs can carry like up to 40 worms. Uh, and so you can imagine what 40 worms in the frog's mouth looks like. Um, you know, this photo has maybe six worms, maybe 10 here. Um, so they can be impactful on the host. 
um, and impactful on communication of the frog host, um, which I'm about to talk about. So um, frogs really heavily depend on calling and listening to communicate and to attract and choose mates. So you might start to think, okay, you have a parasite that attaches inside of the ear canal or attaches to the mouth. That might have some implications for um, frogs communicating. And so actually there was a, a small study done a couple years ago that did show that halopagus can reduce frog hearing ability. Uh, so this graph here, essentially um, what it shows is um, they played a acoustic stimuli, so a sound of a frog call for a bunch of frogs. Some of them were uninfected and some of them were infected with halopagus. And they showed that the infected frogs, this dark bar here, responded um, a lot fewer times, a lot less than uninfected frogs. So they heard maybe this call, but they didn't really respond to it in the proper way. And so this study showed that halopagus does actually negatively impact frog hearing ability. And so what I was interested in is um, looking at this from the frog perspective of calling. So we know that this parasite lives in the mouths of frogs as well as in the ears. So is it maybe impacting how frogs call? So what I ended up doing for this is here's me out in, at my field site um, with my dorky headlamp. Uh, I have my big microphone here and my fancy recorder. And I went out to a pond where I knew there was halopagus and I recorded a bunch of calling frogs. Then I captured those frogs and I put them on my little scale, which is very adorable uh, and took their weight and their length um, and then I put their calls into software and I extracted all of these uh, pieces of data from their calls. Um, and I also evaluated them for parasite load. So I found some frogs that had 20 worms and some frogs that had zero worms. And so I could really easily compare, okay, uh, are frogs that have a lot of worms, do they have lower quality calls than frogs that are uninfected? And so this is all in progress currently, um, but I did find that there is a really interesting signal where frogs that have a medium amount of worms, so six to seven worms, actually have the best calls versus frogs that have a lot of worms or frogs that have zero worms. Um, and essentially what that means, or what I think it means, is that frogs that have a medium amount of worms, that means they're eating dragonflies. So they're eating dragonflies, which means they're getting a lot of food, which means they can have a lot of energy to call really well. Now, there is a trade-off to that. The more dragonflies you eat, the more parasites you're going to get. So at some point, you pass the critical threshold of eating too many dragonflies. Now you have a bunch of parasites and your call starts to decline in quality. Um, but this is an ongoing project. Um, so hopefully I will have some really awesome definitive data to show everybody. Um, but that's sort of the signal that I'm starting to see out of these, uh, out of this project, which is really cool. Um, but also another kind of way I wanna take uh, looking at this parasite in the frogs is again, as I mentioned, Halopagus is a really great model to study parasite population dynamics across all of its hosts. So the snails, the zooplankton, the dragonflies and the frogs. And it's really easy to track parasite infections across a landscape. So track parasite dispersal. Uh, where are the frogs going and are they taking their parasites with them? So what I'm doing with that is um, I want to measure where the frogs go in the field. So frog residence time, so the amount of time they spend at a breeding pond, depending on the species is dependent on reproductive success, right? So a male uh, frog is going to go to a breeding pond, he's going to call, attract a mate, and then he's gonna get the heck out of there because ponds are a very risky place for frogs to be. There are predators there, there are parasites there, as I've been saying, and so generally um, frogs aren't going to be loitering in breeding ponds year round. They actually have this three to four month breeding season. Um, so parasitized frogs that have these lower quality advertisement calls um, may have to spend more time in breeding pools because it takes them longer to attract a mate. If they don't have as good calls or if the females can't hear very well, um, they may be loitering at these breeding ponds for a little bit longer than uninfected frogs that 
um, are gonna get there, mate, and leave. Um, and this is great for the parasite because if a, if a frog is going to spend a lot of time in that breeding pool, um, it's going to be releasing a lot of parasite eggs into that pond. And so it really benefits the parasite to reduce uh, the ability of frogs to communicate because it's gonna keep them in that pond for longer. And so I do wanna look at that um, by looking at, okay, where do these frogs go through the breeding season and afterwards? And are their movement patterns affected by the number of parasites that they have? Question. Yeah, is there any uh, research about parasite resistance like that the host can develop? Yes, and so that's a great question. So as I mentioned earlier, um, parasites and their hosts co-evolve um, closely together over generations. And a big part of that co-evolution is the parasite evolves um, virulence. So it, involves, it evolves the ability to infect that host um, more efficiently because the parasite wants to increase the infection prevalence um, in the host population. So the parasite is constantly evolving uh, virulence and the host is constantly evolving resistance. So you have this back and forth kind of arms race happening. Um, it's called the Red Queen hypothesis. So um, in Alice in Wonderland, um, Alice is running as fast as she can, but she can't ever get ahead. That's essentially what's happening between parasites and their hosts. They're constantly battling. The host evolves resistance, then the parasite evolves um, virulence and back and forth forever. Um, so yes, that is absolutely something that is constantly happening. Um, now, I don't know if I can think of any examples where a host could evolve resistance to the point where it like eliminates the parasite from the population. Most of the time, the parasites can keep up. Um, but that's a good question. Absolutely, that's a huge part of parasitology is, is that resistance evolution. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna be doing with my frogs in the field is tracking them using this super cool harmonic direction finding method. So, um, you, so this uh, technology is used to locate snowboarders and skiers that have been buried by avalanches. So you have a, a person holding a handheld detector and you have these little tags that you can attach to your hat or your vest um, that can be detected and you can be, you know, discovered under snow. So I'm essentially doing that with my frogs. I have a really cool detector and I'm gonna attach these little tags to my frogs and I'll be able to find them no matter where they go. Um, and I can measure all of these different um, pieces of data, um, how long they're actually spending in that pond. Um, and I can track, you know, their mating success, how many worms they have. And really importantly, I can look at parasite dispersal. So, um, you know, are they leaving the pond and taking their parasites with them and possibly colonizing other ponds with parasites? And so that's a big piece of what I'll be doing as well um, with the frogs. Now, I focused a lot on the frogs. Um, I wanted to focus on that for a large part of this talk, but I do want to mention that I'm looking at all of the hosts across this life cycle because they're all really important for um, parasite population dynamics, right? A lot of what happens in the early hosts is going to determine what happens in the frogs, right? So with dragonflies, for example, they are highly cannibalistic. As I said, if you put 10 dragonflies in a cup, an hour later, you're gonna have one. They are absolutely voracious. Uh, and so I'm looking at, in large part, how does cannibalism in the dragonfly host affect parasite transmission? both among dragonflies and from dragonfly to frog, because that's going to have a lot to do with how many parasites the frogs get and how many um, you know, parasite eggs eventually get deposited in the pond. Um, and I'll also be looking at zooplankton. Um, so there's this phenomenon called parasite-induced trophic transmission. It happened in our frogs. So when the frogs grew a bunch of extra legs, they were more easy, easily eaten by the bird. That is a um, parasite-induced modification of the host. Um, I will be looking at that in the zooplankton hosts in terms of behavior. So parasites can affect the behavior of their hosts to the point where sometimes hosts are called zombies um, in the popular literature um, because parasites can influence host behavior to benefit the life cycle. And I'm exploring that in the zooplankton because if um, you know these zooplankton are zombies, 
then they might be more easily eaten by the dragonfly and thus that life cycle is going to be improved. And so I'm exploring all of these different things in the invertebrate hosts as well as in the frogs. Um, so I guess I'm coming pretty close to the end here of my planned talk, um, but I wanted to end with, okay, I've been talking about parasites as parts of ecosystems, yes, but I've been mainly talking about them as, you know, pieces of disease, right? Part, they are diseases and pathogens that travel through ecosystems, they make us sick, and they make wildlife sick, but they are a lot more than that. So I've already um, talked a bit about how they contribute to ecosystem stability. So the more links you have in an ecosystem and the more uh, bi the higher biodiversity you have, the more species you have in a food web, the more stable that ecosystem is going to be to disturbance, um, even uh, human induced disturbance like uh, you know chemical runoff or habitat degradation. And parasites contribute an enormous amount of linkages and species to food webs and they can um, contribute to that stability. Um, but they're also being used uh, more recently as indicators for ecosystem health. Um, so a lot of um, scientists here at ECU actually work on this. And I can talk a little bit about this um, later on if y'all want. Um, I don't personally work on these um, projects as much, but um, what a lot of scientists are looking at is using parasites as indicators. So, okay, we know that this parasite uses four hosts. If we find this parasite in a system, we know that those four hosts have to be here. And so they're really great indicators for biodiversity. And if you start to lose parasite species, you can kind of infer, okay, we're starting to lose hosts. Something's going wrong here. Um, but the other really interesting thing about parasites is that they can actually help mitigate human disease. Um, and there have been some really recent um, studies showing that parasites can be a medical treatment. So um, one of the really kind of fascinating uh, hypotheses out there is what's called the hygiene hypothesis. Um, so a bunch of scientists back in the 80s realized that uh, people in Western countries that have very well-developed sanitation systems had really high rates of um, autoimmune disorders of the stomach and intestines. So ulcerative colitis, um, and like irritable bowel syndrome was very high um, in uh, very high sanitation countries versus um, other countries that didn't have that. And so when they were looking at these differences, they noticed that parasitic worms were very strongly correlated with the reduction in um, autoimmune diseases. And what the theory there is, is that as I've sort of talked about a couple times, um, hosts and parasites have co-evolved um, very uh, carefully over the generations. And as humans, our immune systems have evolved with our parasites. So our immune systems have been battling parasites for millions of years. Well, we eliminated the vast majority of parasites from our immediate environment in our Western countries in the span of a hundred years and in evolutionary terms as an incredibly short time period. So our immune systems do not know what to do because they've been fighting our parasites for generations. All of a sudden there's nothing to fight. And so what ends up occurring is that your immune systems or our immune systems go haywire. They're so used to fighting off parasites that they end up turning on ourselves and causing inflammation of our intestinal tract which is why we have these really high rates of autoimmune diseases in more sanitized environments. Question? Yeah, this is a great time to bring up, Molly asked, um, do diseases from parasites, um, are there a huge threat to humans? And she brought up mosquitoes as an example. So can you okay. talk about some of the work being done to manage parasites for human health? Um, and her example for that was such as genetic engineering mosquitoes. Yes, so we absolutely face um, enormous risk from parasites. Um, so malaria in mosquitoes is a really great example. Um, schistosomiasis is another one. I think between the two of them, those are those infect the like vast majority of um, diseases in the world. We have like enormous amounts of malaria and schistosomiasis worldwide. Um, 
and those are both parasites. Um, so as for management tactics, um, for parasites that have multiple hosts, managing individual hosts sometimes can break the link of that life cycle um, and that can help protect us from disease. So as you mentioned with the mosquitoes, um, if you uh, break the link at the mosquito, that parasite is never going to reach us. And so there's been um, some really cool work done with mosquitoes in terms of um, genetic engineering in that um, um, sterile mosquitoes that can't have babies are being created and actually released into the wild. Um, and uh, also uh, they have created some genetically modified mosquitoes that are always male. And male mosquitoes um, do not bite humans, only the females bite humans. And so if you release these uh, genetically mod modified mosquitoes into the greater population that only create male mosquitoes, eventually you're going to drive down your malaria risk because you're just not gonna have as many females biting people. Um, same thing with schistosomiasis. It's another parasite that uses snails. Um, a lot of the management there is removing the snails from the system and that removes the risk for humans. So yeah, addressing individual hosts is one of the cruxes of managing parasite and human disease. Go for it. Yeah, this is a really good one too. Simon asks, are parasites able to adapt to different climates? For instance, if birds migrate from cooler to warmer areas uh, of the country, does this affect their the parasite's ability to thrive? Great question. Um, so one of the reasons why parasitism is such a popular, popular lifestyle for organisms across the globe is because um, if you're a parasite, especially if you're an endoparasite, so you live inside your host, you are protected from the environment around you. So um, for example, with birds that carry worms, the worms inside the gut of the bird are protected from those environmental conditions. So, um, you know, birds generally have a relatively stable temperature, a relatively stable um, electrolyte level, all of those things. And so when the bird moves from a cold climate to a warm climate, that parasite is doing just fine because it's got air conditioning, it's got as much food as it wants, and it is protected from that. Um, so I feel like, yeah, I'm trying to think in terms of ectoparasites that don't have that protection. Definitely evolution occurs um, across evolutionary timescales. So you definitely have parasites that evolve to warmer temperatures just like their hosts do. Um, a lot of times you have parasites following their hosts um, where you know a host might evolve to tolerate higher altitude. Its parasites are gonna follow it. And if they can keep up with that, um, they're gonna also adapt to that. Um, parasites are incredibly adaptable. Go for it. Yeah, and so one of my questions was wondering how, if there's a lot of research in, or any research of, regarding climate change in parasites. So if you have those internal parasites that don't really, uh, are, aren't really as affected by their environment, um, what sorts of things are we seeing besides like host loss, if anything? That's a great question. And there are a lot of pieces to that. So like what you said with host loss, um, for every host, species that we lose to extinction, we probably lose at least five parasite species. Um, and so climate change and habitat degradation is not great for parasites because of host loss. Now, on the other side of things, climate change um, specifically can cause the emergence of disease because what occurs with a lot of hosts that are um, more temperature sensitive they become stressed when they get too hot or too cold. And so when climate change occurs, you have this chronic stress on these organisms and they are much less able to fight off parasites. And so you have more parasites infecting your hosts. Um, you have um, higher population size of parasites. Um, and so in terms of just raw parasite infection and disease risk, glo uh, global climate change in particular is going to increase that most likely um, while decreasing maybe biodiversity of parasites, if that makes sense. 
Um, and there are a bunch of other things as well. I mean, um, rain shifts are occurring. So as the ocean and as the climate warms, um, we have colder organisms moving um, northward and warmer organisms encroaching on that, and they are going to carry their parasites with them. So we're going to see a rain shift in parasites as well as hosts. And we have about four more questions left. Did you have anything um, that you wanted to add before you wrap up your presentation? Um, I guess I just have one more slide um, just saying, hey, we really need to protect our ecosystems, protect our frogs, and also their parasites. Um, so here you can, if you find any deformed frogs, like what some of the photos I've shown, um, you can actually report that. So a huge and important part of um, studying parasites and limiting the negative effects they have is um, monitoring. And so if you find any um, deformed frogs, you can report it and it will tell scientists where you've been finding frogs that have extra legs, which is really useful for um, monitoring. Um, and yeah, just don't release your pets ever into the wild. They can carry parasites, which is not good. Um, and again, like I said, for every host species that goes extinct, parasite species will follow it. So <laughs> I'll take as many questions as y'all want now. That's, I think that's the last slide I, slide I had. So uh, there's one more regarding your research um, that was asked in uh, talking about the calls of the frogs. Um, was there any negative benefit, or negative benefit, wow. Was there any negative influence to the females besides their maybe loss of hearing? That's a good question. Um, probably not anything that's measurable now, maybe, and this has never been studied. Um, maybe I'll be able to look at it at some point. Uh, maybe if you have these really large aggregations of parasites in your mouth, um, there might be some problems with eating um, and that might lead to maybe lower body mass and lower um, fitness in certain frogs. Um, for females specifically, probably not anything specific to them. Um, but yeah, that's probably what I would say is you might have lower body condition um, at very high abundance. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, do you know off the top of your head, what is uh, a parasite that has the most hosts that you've heard of? Is four kind of the max? There are some that have five or six. I cannot think of them off the top of my head. Um, but they can be get up to be that many. They can, yes. Wow. Um, generally more than that, I think that's when you hit threshold of you just have too many hosts and it's now detrimental. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, four hosts for a trematode is unusual. The vast, vast majority of them have three and mm -hmm. some have two. And uh, do you have a favorite parasite or one that you think is the coolest parasite? <gasps> Oh my gosh, I have too many. Okay, so the guinea worm is definitely one of my favorites. Um, and maybe I shouldn't say that because it is a human disease, but um, it has a really um, like really crazy life cycle. So the, so the guinea worm um, is a human specific parasite too, um, a human specific worm. Uh, and so what happens with this parasite is, um, so a human will drink water from an infected source which contains um, zooplankton or water fleas that carry the parasite inside of them. So if a human consumes that, the adult worm uh, lives in the gut. Once it becomes an adult and decides it wants to have eggs, it actually exits your stomach and crawls through your tissue down your leg and pokes its head out of your ankle. So you get this little blister on your ankle and a worm kind of pops out of it. Um, and you know what, what happens when you have a blister on your foot that hurts? You wanna soak it in water. So you go to the water and you put your foot in the water while these worms have these explosive um, ends on them that explode as soon as they touch water. And so these worms explode and they release a ton of eggs back into the water where they infect the, the water fleas and start the life cycle back over again. Um, and it's, I think it's just so fascinating that it, that it specifically depends on the human's uh, instinct to go soak their foot in water. And that's where the life cycle restarts. Um, so I, I really do like the guinea worm. It is very, very close to being eradicated. Um, and actually might already be eradicated. 
Um, I think it, it's an incredibly, incredibly rare parasite these days um, because there have been um, there's been a huge effort to completely eradicate it. Um, and I yeah, think it's like almost like they know how to manipulate humans. Exactly. All they I think a huge part of eradicating that parasite was education. They just told people, hey, if you have a blister on your foot, don't go put your foot in the water. Um, you know, wash it in a bathtub if you want, and you know, don't go to the water source where everyone else is drinking. And that broke the life cycle of the parasite and now it's eradicated. Yeah, and uh, so this seems like a great follow-up question to that Ooh. odd parasite. Uh, what got you interested in researching parasites? <laughs> oh gosh, what a great question. Um, so yeah, so I, I was in college in my last year um, and I was introduced, so I didn't know anything about parasites um, at all. I had no idea that a parasite could have more than one host. I, I knew, you know, okay, tapeworm is a parasite and that's about as far as I got. Um, but I had the amazing opportunity to work on a project um, actually out at the Duke Marine Lab on, uh, out in Beaufort, North Carolina. Um, and there was a, there's a lab there that studies salt marshes. And so if you know anything about salt marshes, they are, um, absolutely vital for protecting our coastlines. Well, there were a lot of uh, marshes that were dying off because of grazing snails. And so I got to work on a project studying the parasites of the snails as kind of a biocontrol mechanism because these parasites castrate snails. Um, so snails um, cannot reproduce if they have this parasite. And so um, they were being studied as kind of a biocontrol type thing. Um, and working on that, I realized how complex parasites can be and how important they are because in marshes that have parasites, they were not experiencing marsh die off, uh, only the marshes that had lower parasite prevalence. Um, and it was honestly like a light bulb. It was insane. I, I had never heard of anything like that before. Um, and ever since then, I've just been working on parasites since then. Um, I just really love, I really love the concept of all of these complex interactions going on under the surface that, you know, you would never look at a frog and think about the worms that it has inside of it, but pretty much every frog in the wild is gonna have worms. So, um, yeah. Nice. So you're the, you're the advocate for the unsung heroes. Yes. <laughs> No one ever thinks about the parasites. Yeah, there's a good comment here that says, great job. As a lawyer, I've been accused of being a parasite, but now it doesn't seem like such a bad thing, so. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. Okay. Wear that badge with pride. <laughs> <laughs> and I see that you're in the lab. I don't know if we have time to quickly run oh. through if you wanted to show us around the lab a little bit, but I sure. think uh, that would be a great way to end it. Yeah, Um. so I actually did bring um, my very favorite frog. So um, in order to study these parasites, I have to keep all of their hosts in the lab. Um, Will you so, quickly unshare your screen so we can see oh, it? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Cool, uh, thanks. Uh, how do I stop share? Okay. Um, so um, I have to keep all of um, the hosts for my parasites that I study in the lab. So I brought my favorite frog today. His name is Jabba because he's very large. Uh, and here he is. Oh, there he is. Can y'all see him okay? <laughs> yep, so this is Jabba, the tree frog. Um, he um, has halopagus and he poops out eggs for me. Um, so I can use them in my experiments. Uh, so it is hilarious. I will tell my um, family back home, you know, what do I do at grad school? Well, I collect poop a lot. Um, so this is, so I keep about 10 frogs in here that carry this parasite. And the interesting thing about Java here is that he actually has another parasite. At least I'm pretty sure he does. I don't know how, if y'all can tell, he, um, he's very round. So he is a very swollen frog and he's not fat. He actually has a parasite called Echinostoma, which actually messes up his fluid balances and makes him kind of swell up like a balloon. Um, and so that uh, kind of shows that frogs can get infected with a bunch of different parasites and they generally have more than one. Um, so that's Java. And I also, of course, have to keep um, all the other hosts as well. So I have a lot of these really beautiful round snails um, in my lab and I keep, you know, 
a bunch of different um, colonies of these guys. And I actually infect these guys with parasites in the lab myself. Um, so, you know, sucks to be a snail. Um, Diabolical. Yes. <laughs> Luckily though, for my frogs, um, you know, because they have halopagus generally at low prevalence. So they don't really suffer from having halopagus and they get as many crickets and as much food as they want. And there are no predators in here. So being a frog in my lab is a great deal. <laughs> um, so yeah, I actually can't really walk y'all around the, the lab in here too much. Um, I can't leave the room with a video on, but I will show y'all. So there's another member of my lab who also studies frogs and she has a bunch of tadpoles in here. I don't know if y'all can see a little tadpole right there. So um, she has a bunch of different tanks full of tadpoles. Um, and so we kind of keep a bunch of rooms full of aquariums and we just have a bunch of animals down here um, that we utilize for our research. And you just hang out with them all day. We do hang out with them all day. I think <laughs> come in and just stare at my frogs. <laughs> I love it. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. This was a really great presentation. And also I love that you mentioned the poop thing because I have this like ongoing theme, it seems that a lot of these presentations kind of come full circle and they're like, and it really comes down to the poop. <laughs> and so I'm like, I just love <laughs> So, <laughs> very useful stuff. Well, thank you so much. This was a really great talk. Okay, well, thank you. I had a great time. Thank you all so much for listening. All right. And we will see everyone next week. Bye.